All right. Once, yeah, it, it will go in in the next 30 seconds or so. OK. OK, that's fine. Otherwise, how are you doing? Good. Even yeah, before we, we go live. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Dr. Fundi Lenyati. Uh, I'm the host uh, of this uh, channel. Uh, today, Hi. we uh, have a special guest, Dr. Zikona. Um, you know, uh, she's got a double barrel surname. <laughs> so it's Dr. Zikona Chwadi Ngeva. Um, she is our special guest today. As you all know, um, this month is a month uh, that is dedicated to women in South Africa. Uh, and uh, at this channel, we decided that we want to profile, we want to make noise about females, you know, or women who in their respective you know, careers or professions, they have actually done great things. So I've had meet, you know, people from the healthcare space. Uh, I've had people from the business space. Uh, I've had people who are entrepreneurs. Uh, today, um, I have an academic, uh, you know, uh, somebody who eats, sleeps and drinks chemistry. Uh, something that used to give us challenges, some of us uh, when we were still in high school. So I want to understand from her, you know, how come she chose to actually develop a career in this subject that really used to give some of us, you know, uh, uh, challenges. So, um, but anyway, uh, Dr. Chuabingeva, uh, that is Zikona or Ziko, you know, on Facebook, she just goes by the name Zico TN. I think I find it easier to use that than to actually use the long name of Zico Natua Bingeva. She is a, a senior lecturer at the Department of Chemistry uh, at the Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth. All right. Now, the reason why I asked her to come and share her journey with us is the fact that you know, she is a doctor, not a medical doctor like me. You know, she's a real doctor. Uh, she's got a PhD, uh, not an undergraduate degree, uh, you know, that makes you to become a doctor. She has gone through a very different path to becoming a doctor. And I'm saying a very different path because we used to people, people doing, uh, you know, their undergraduate degree, uh, a bachelor degree, uh, and then they go and do maybe honors, masters, and then a PhD. But she took a different route. And she needs to tell us why her route was different. But at the end, it came to the same place, you know? Yep. Um, so she did her national diploma in a, you know, more like a technical. And then she went and did a BTEC. After a BTEC, she went and did an MTEC. And then after an MTEC, she then got a PhD in chemistry. And that's why now she is a senior lecturer, uh, you know, in, in, in that university uh, at the Bay. So Dr. Zikona Chuabingeva, welcome to the Dr. Fundi channel. Thank you so much, Doc. Um, good evening to everybody that's tuning in. And I'm really sorry about my problems with lightning. And uh, as I did mention, I'm in the car, I'm actually in town, I couldn't go back home because I knew that the network was going to be a problem. So I, I profusely apologize when it comes to this lightning, but I think I'm a yellow bone, so I'm going to light this place up. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, definitely you have, uh, you know, uh, lit the place up already. Um, all right, uh, just to tell people where you are. You are in a town in the Eastern Cape called Queenstown. It's one of the coldest towns that I've ever been in in the Eastern Cape. 
you know, uh, I'm sure uh, when it comes to, you know, September, December, uh, the results of the cold, cold, cold winter, they, they start to show. <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> Dr. Zico TN, um, just tell us, you know, who are you? Uh, and I'm not here looking at the academic side of you, the okay. person. You know, you are now in Queenstown uh, in the Eastern Cape, but you originally come from a rural village outside yes. of that town, outside of a place called Ilinge. Just tell us a little bit about who you are, uh, the family you grew up in, you know, was it you know, where you were first born, last born, and, and things like that. Okay, so as you did mention, the name is Zikona Chwabingeva. So I was born and bred in Matribini village. It's a couple of kilometers away from Queenstown. It's actually en route to Katkat and Tofimbaba. Yeah. yeah, so you branch off in some town called Ilinge, and that is the township before you get to the village. So I was raised by my two maternal grandparents, that is my grandmother and my grandfather. Yeah. Um, Yes, my mom had me when she was 15, so she was still at school. Um, so she was required to go back to school. And then my grandparents, they actually took over. Um, so I'm the first born at home and I only have one sibling and a young, well, he's a younger brother. He's three years younger than me. And I, I grew up in that environment of a big family, if I may put it that way, because remember I was staying with grandparents. So that means we were surrounded by a lot of aunts, a lot of, a lot of cousins, and you know, a lot of other aunts, like my mother's cousins. And yeah, so we, I, I grew up in a very big family, but a, a family of dreamers. And yeah. um, my grandmother was a teacher. So she yeah. started working at 18. And my grandfather used to work for the Department of Agriculture. So they were kind of like a middle-class kind of family. So uh -huh. we, we were okay. So you grew up privileged, would I say, sir? Well, compared to As the people around where you were? Compared to the people to where I, I, I grew up in, yes, I was kind of privileged. Okay, all right. Because so, at least we had the basics. So yeah, I guess, I guess I was privileged. All right, but there's something that you mentioned that I think I want us to just go back to. You said, um, you, um, you know, uh, you grew up in a family of dreamers. Can you just explain what you meant about that? Because I want to be able to link this family of dreamers to the dreams that you had. Okay. So what I actually mean by that is the family that I grew up in, they instilled this habit of, you know, working hard and dreaming and they used to sort of like support each and every dream from each and every cousin or each and every toddler in that house from a very, very young age. Like growing up, I, I know this is going to be funny. I used to tell my grandfather that I wanted to be a video vixen. And I remember looking at videos on channel O and I used to tell him this, I want to be that girl who's wearing that mini skirt and dancing to that tune. And, you know, he never, he never used to say that, Aibo, what is that, Mdanam? you know? And he was like, go for it. If that's what you want, then go for it. So that is what I mean by a family of dreamers and people that actually support all your dreams. So yeah. I know that dream was a bit crazy and far-fetched, but he made me believe that I can be anything I wanted to be in the entire world. Okay, now, let's just, just, just between me and you now. No, no one is listening. Did you really, really, really want to be a video vixen? <laughs> well, between me and you, I think I was fascinated by a whole lot of things. Yeah. I, I, I was not really aware what being a video vixen is at that time. Yeah. So I, yeah, <laughs> between me and you, I, I'm so glad that I took a different path, but yeah. All right. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. All right. So, but I think the key message that you wanted to share with us was that uh, you were not you, you were not limited in terms of what you wanted to be. You could have been anything that you wanted. Uh, the parents and the grandparents would just support you in your chosen dream, whatever it was. I think that's the key message that you want to give us. And you had yes, a teacher, you know, uh, around in the family, and uh, obviously education then 
was one of the very important things uh, in that family, right? Yes, 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 Doc, it was. It mm -hmm. was. And um, my, grand my grandmother actually believed so much in education and she believed so much in women, you know, equipping themselves with necessary skills so that they can be financially independent and self-sufficient and, you know, all those things. What was the motivation? Uh, you know, uh, had she seen too many <laughs> ladies uh, getting married and not being uh, independent and then the guy disappears and the ladies, you know, in, why do you think yeah. she was pushing the line of you becoming independent? Okay, so as I did mention, my, my mother got me when she was 15. So she was fairly young. And um, I think my grandmother at some stage actually felt as if I was going to fall under the same track or something, yeah. if I may put it like that. So yeah. she was a bit scared of me following the very same route that my mom took. And she was trying to caution me against doing that very same or repeating that same mistake. Yeah. And another thing is, you know, in the villages, um, there's not a lot of women back then who used to be educated, who used to drive their own cars, who used to be financially independent and, 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 and. Because most women, well, they actually just saw marriage as, as, as how do I put it, as an achievement. And, you know, yeah. just um, being supported by their spouses and not being self-sufficient. Um, so I think she was trying to caution me against all that. And because there was a lot of girls in my family, as my name is the corner. So it means yeah. we had a lot of cousins running around the house. So that's the corner. And in um, fact, And so she was really trying to go to the mentality and over there's a man that's actually going to, to look after you, you know? Yeah. And because she did it, well, she did it in her own way, that is being self-sufficient and independent from a very young age of, I think she started working at 18. Yeah. So she, she knew and have your own things and the freedom that comes with it, even though you might want to get married, but yeah, I, I think <laughs> okay. Lovely. I don't know Lovely. to say much. <laughs> All right. So besides education and being allowed to dream a lot, what were the other things that you would say um, when you look back, these are the things that I learned, you know, these are the influences from back in the day, uh, you know, the values that still guide you today as your moral compass, you know, uh, you know, generally. Uh, even though you are an adult, but you go back and say, you know what, uh, this and that and that and that, yeah. Okay, so one of the most important values that my grandparents instilled in me and that I still use today is um, the values of Ubuntu. Meaning? Um, meaning, uh, I am because you are. Okay. And at the same time, the values of, you know, when you see a person, my grandmother used to say this to me, Auntie, whenever you meet a person, you must always see God in that person because you've never met God. Yeah. So you must treat that person with so much respect, even if they are not worth anything in your so-called eyes. So mm -hmm. I, I got to learn that. And it, I think it works for me, especially in my adult life, because even at work, I, I don't look at a security guard as, someone who's low, who's below me, but I, I give them or offer them the same respect as I would give to our vice chancellor, you know? Yeah. So they taught me all those values and the values of time. My grandparents were very strict when it comes to time. And they used to say something like, the minute you lose one minute of your time in a day, that means you are losing a 1 million rands that you should have been making in that one minute of your time. So kind of thing. So all those values and obviously, the values of always, you know, trying to be, try and be humble and kindness, you know, all those yeah. major values that we all grew up from. Yeah. And yeah, yeah so I, I, I got to learn a lot from them. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So um, besides uh, wanting to be a video vixen, uh, how was your schooling? How was your uh, schooling junior and, and senior? Because I'm just trying to get those formative years to a point where you started you know, thinking that actually pursuing science and chemistry is something 
that could actually take you places. Okay, so it looks like we are load shedding. So yeah. <laughs> there's fine. no light at there's oh, no light at all. But yeah, we'll just rely on this one. Okay, so yeah. I went to I went to my grandmother's school. That's where I did my grade. So standard 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 A and up to standard two. No, there's no so, standard A. It's sub A. Eh? There's sub A, sub B, and then standard one, two, three, up to you know standard. <laughs> okay, 10. so I I did sub A and up to standard two um at the school where my grandmother was teaching it and after that i moved to another school and i i forgot to mention that my we 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 lived in a small town called whitlesey i think it's 50 kilometers out of queenstown queenstown but at the same time it's more townshipy compared to the rural areas that we come from yeah. so compared to my community so it was a bit you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I I did my sub A up until standard two at her school, and then I moved to another school called Shiloh Primary School. It's yeah. still in 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 Whittlesey. Yeah. Um, and then I did uh what is it, standard three up until standard five there. And right. I also want to highlight the mere fact that I was very good in mathematics. Yeah. And <laughs> And yeah. um, from there, I actually moved to Mpumalanga and that's where I did all my high school. So I lived in a very small town called Kinros in Pumalanga. Yeah. And that's where I discovered a lot about uh, my abilities and my strengths and a whole lot of other things. Because, um, you know, moving wait, from wait. a township. Wait, Doc, uh, you're moving too fast for me now. So <laughs> you're moving too fast. So, um, you were very good with maths. Was it real maths uh, or were we talking here arithmetic? <laughs> you know, if I can tell you right now, the mathematics that we were taught yeah. um, at that time, I still use it up until today. Lovely. And that's how Lovely. good it was. All right. So why did you switch, did you switch from the Eastern Cape to Pumalanga? Um, we were, I, I, I was looking for better opportunities and I had an aunt who was married to my uncle and they lived in a small town of Kinross. So my uncle was working for, for Sasol. Yeah. So it only made sense that I think they also saw something in me. Yeah. I'm not sure what it is, but um, they actually felt that I needed, you know, better opportunities in terms of schooling opportunities. So um, I moved to Mpumalanga and I did my grade eight and up until grade 10. Yeah. Okay. And um, you are, during those years, you know, it's still the, the, the what, what are the courses that we're doing at that time? I can't even remember, but yeah. we're actually doing almost everything. And then I, I moved back to Queenstown and I did my grade 11 and grade 12 at Hexagon High School. Is that a Model C school or what kind of school was that? Yes, it is a Model C school. And back then it was a private school, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Um. So yeah, I did my grade eleven and grade twelve there. Yeah. And um, I did a mixture of I I I don't know who chose that scheme. I don't know, but because I didn't know what I wanted to be, so I did quite a combination of subjects. Because I did biology, I did mathematics, I did accounting, I yeah. did physical sciences, I did English, and I did Afrikaans. Yeah. But I was right. I was ex. I was extremely good in accounting and math. Yeah. Okay. Now, just a little bit. So, the time you were in Pumalanga and uh, your brother-in-law, is it a brother-in-law, was working at Sasol? My aunt's husband. Oh, your aunt's husband was working at Sasol. So, that's my you, uncle. Yeah. So, you did not necessarily uh, develop an interest in chemistry because of your exposure to what Sasol, you know, uh, you know, the stuff that was done there or that, you know, uh, Sasol done. Not yeah. at all. All right. Not so, at all. Okay. All right. So, okay. Back to the Eastern Cape. Why? Um, there was a lot of changes in, in my family. Okay. And I don't actually want to get into details. No, no, let's that. not get into it. But there were some <laughs> family changes that necessitated. Yes, that there were some family, family changes. And yes, so I had to move from Pumalanga and come back to the Eastern Cape. 
All right. So, so hence, I, so hence, I even enrolled in a private school because there was just no time for me to apply um, in time, you know, for enrollment in a normal school. Yeah. Or yeah. Okay, fine. So, how was how would you describe that uh, uh, those last two years of schooling in terms of shaping your life as we see? They were today? they were quite they were quite challenging and hard. Um, because you must remember when you join a high school at grade 11, you're already meeting people that have been studying together for how many years? And then they, they don't give you a chance to be the person that you actually want to be. And at the same time, I think even the teachers, they, they, they're a bit reluctant. You know, they don't trust this person that has joined them, kind of. And it was a small school, so it was easy for people to sort of like know each other from way back. Uh, but it was challenging, but I did manage to pick up, I think, um, during the course of the first year. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it, it was quite challenging, I must say. Also the move and the language and everything else, you, you know how it is, and the environment. So yeah, it was quite challenging. All right, so what would you say uh, is one thing that you learned at that school, and I'm, 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 uh, not about, I'm, not, I'm not talking about subject content. Go about yeah. in terms of life. Yeah, I've learned to be very patient with myself, and I've learned to really trust myself because the only thing that really kept me going was my confidence. I was yeah. very confident. You wouldn't tell that I was that you part fika because I was extremely confident in everything that I used to do in that school. You would swear that I was there for over, I don't know how many years. So yeah. I was extremely confident. Mm. All right. And this confidence in Bella, this is <laughs> um your goodness. Ah uh, goodness. Uh, the confidence. Yes. Uh, were, were you involved in some some drama or speech and drama things or whatever acting or you know um I, I i used to do some extramural activities at my previous school in pumalanga so i used to do dance ballroom dancing i used to sing i used to play netball so i was i was quite involved in a lot of things and yeah. um i think because i i i had that thing in me that you know what you come from um, the rural areas. So you must try and grab each and every opportunity that you get so that you can advance your career as well as your life. So I think the confidence comes from the fact that I gave everything a chance in my life. Like I grabbed each and every opportunity that came my way and I gave it 120%, you know? Yeah. So yes. I, I, I got to learn to, 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 to work on my confidence as well as my self-esteem because yeah. I was slowly building myself at that time. So yeah. yeah, that's where it all comes from. Yeah, lovely, lovely. All right, so how were your results? And, and your and um, metric? metric results were not good. Um, yeah. They were not really good. I was, as I did mention, I was very good in accounting. I had a B in accounting. Yeah. So I, um, but my physics was not good at all. Um, my maths was still fine because I had a C in maths, but my yeah. physics was not good. Um, very, you know that you are now. Yes, a, a I know. I know. <laughs> you really did badly in matric. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, not bad, bad, bad because I had fifty something. But yeah, that's not good for someone yeah, who is a who is a physical chemist right now. Yeah, yeah. You know that's a, what we used to call that math daughter score. You know, just, just, you know, 51, 52, you know, uh, when you are at that level, you don't think about taking that further. But uh, funny enough, you had confidence. And all right. So um, you then decided you must apply to tertiary uh, and uh, you got accepted at Deben University of Technology. Uh, right. Yes. Yes, Doc. Actually, what happened is I applied to VETS and I applied to UKZN because I wanted to do medicine. And remember back then, there was this buzz about being a medical doctor. Yes, and I think would. even our family. Sorry. So that buzz, why? 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 why I think it all, I think it all comes from our our families and our communities. They actually felt Sindoba 
if you are a medical doctor, you hold a high, I don't know what to call it, but <laughs> it Wait, is, no. why, why did you want to be one? I, I don't think you I even wanted to be Queenstown. <laughs> and they were bawling. So I, I was like, now I think I'm a right to bar. But yeah. I, I, I did not really want to be a medical doctor because I didn't even understand what it actually entails, that entire career. Yeah. And so I applied to UKZN. And while waiting for the outcome of my admission application at UKZN, um, yes, most la pressure, a lot of your friends from school, they getting a uh, placement. And I was like to my parents, okay, I'm just gonna go to Devon and I'm going to find out what is happening there. So when I got there, um, I went to UKZN to inquire and at UKZN, they were giving me a run around. And um, because I was panicking, I went to, which course can I do for like a year, but in the second year that I can convert and, and get into the medical, school yeah. and everyone was like okay you can do biotech you can do whatever and mind you i'm walking alone in that university and asking different people i think it was src people yeah okay so i i then um i was referred to my one of our neighbors from from emma uh yeah. may his soul rest in peace so i used to refer to him as an uncle because he was wa- he was already working in Devon. So he was like, okay, I heard about this course called analytical chemistry, and I know it does some science. And I think that science here is Okfagawa Medical School, uh, blah, 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 blah. So I just I just took that. In fact, when I got to the Department of Chemistry at DUT, I think what's actually like two, if not three spaces to get into the program. Yeah. So I got in, I registered same day, I got res, and I was fine. <laughs> and, and this is somebody who didn't do particularly well in chemistry and she chooses to go and do analytical chemistry you know yes talk of confidence eh? <laughs> <laughs> yes doc and um i think after six months of doing that course i i got i got a scholarship yeah. i got a scholarship from cheetah oh cheetah is chemical Industries, don't don't, but it's a sita. It's one of those sitters. Onko siamdi libele inifanda zam, but yeah. So I got a scholarship from Cheetah, and they were basically paying for my everything, and I never looked back. So I was like, okay, I'm fine here, and then yeah, I never looked back. So you did your national diploma over how long? I did it for three years. All right. Uh, and three you- years and one year. Well, three years. Kuko nunyako one way in service training. Yeah. All right. So, so now the dreams about doing medicine, you abandoned that. I was like, I man, I'm I'm fine here. I, I think I was actually enjoying the chemistry yeah. when I was doing it. I started yeah. enjoying it and I, I gave it my all. Oh, and I forgot to also mention I failed my mathematics in the first semester. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. I failed mathematics. And it was one of the majors. Um, so the whole comes, but luckily I sent the second semester. Yeah. So I did that. I had to motivate command paper, but listen, man, I will I will try and pass this module. Yeah. And then I did, and then so in the second year, I, I continued with analytical chemistry, and then I, I completed all my theory, and then I went straight to in-service training. I did my in-service training at Dunlop. Yeah. And I was the only student or I place at Dunlop. I was the first student to be placed at Dunlop Laboratories and to also be placed there and do my in-service training there. So even the experience that I got there, it, it's sort of like, and yes, my name is Evans got to talk. I don't know how to put it, but I did not plan any of those things. I did not even plan a career in chemistry. Yeah, okay. But obviously you were enjoying it and you were now... Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, somebody who was the first at Dunlop Laboratories. So you are starting your, you know, a woman, you know, first, first this, first that, you know. All right. Okay, fine. And then um, you then decided that, no, man, I'm actually going to continue. Uh, now, okay. the question I want to ask you, though, uh, is 
when we talk to kids who have just finished matric, uh, you know, almost everybody wants to go to a university, right? As in the old way, university. Yes. Those uh, technicons or universities of technology, uh, there tends to be some attitude. I don't know if, if you know, I, I, want to, I want to address that. You know, some people who can actually get accepted at a university of technology, when they don't get accepted at a normal, I'll call it normal university. Traditional you know, universities. Yes, you know, they actually feel like it's the end of the world. But there you were actually starting your, you know, tertiary, you know, uh, education at a university of technology. Uh, when you told your parents that you have enrolled at a university of technology and not the traditional university, uh, was there any issue about that or they trusted your judgment? Um, as I did mention with, with my parents, when I refer to my parents, I obviously refer to my grandparents because yeah. yes. Yeah. With my grandparents, they were not really clued up because remember, they, I don't even think they knew what was the difference between a traditional university and a university of technology. Yeah. And because they were supporting me and my dreams, I think they trusted my judgment a lot and my decisions. Yeah. So the only thing they did was just to support me. Whatever yeah. I wanted, go for it. And wherever you wanted to go and study, just do that. Okay. All right. So um, yeah. I am very much aware of, 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 of what you were just saying right now about um, some students preferring to go to a traditional university. I guess they, I, I maybe I'm gonna be biased a bit because I, I now I currently teach in a university of technology that measured with, 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 with a traditional university. And I've also, all my life, I've been working in a traditional university and I, I'm gonna be very biased when it comes to answering this question. So can I just skip that question? Uh-uh, I was with you, but I want an answer. <laughs> Okay, but maybe a, a same you know answer what? would be. You, you yes. know the reason why I'm asking you this question? Yes. Because uh, so many people stop dreaming just because they did not get accepted in a traditional university. They would rather sit at home rather than and to go to. Case. You know, I mean, look at where you are now. You are at the same level, you know, with any other you know, PhD person. Yeah. You know, so for me, I think the reason why I'm insisting on this is because I want to take away that, you know, uh, stigma. Yeah, if I'll stigma. It. So uh, people must understand, Uti, you know, it's just another another way of acquiring knowledge and skills, but you'll end up at the same point. You can go as far as you want. That's the reason yeah. really why I wanted, you know, to get into this. All right, but let's leave it. Let's, let's leave it, uh, <laughs> you know, you're going to tell us so you did your two years and you spent time at Dunlop. What did you learn at Dunlop? Just um, so basically at Dunlop, I was an in-service trainee and I was working on raw materials because yeah. you, we, we all understand that Dunlop makes tires, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of mixing that happens before we make a tire. Yeah. So I was actually in that lab where we were mixing different raw materials and for different tires and for different cars. Yeah. Um, so when I was there, I learned quite a lot about, you know, being in the field of, 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 of application of science as a whole. Yeah. And um, also, you know, when you are in a job straight from school, you learn other, you learn other soft skills, like yeah. interpersonal skills, communication skills, organization skills, project management, all those things. And time management, which was extremely important because you work in a factory, if the truck is arriving at half past seven with your raw material, that means you need to be there at quarter past seven. Yeah. And you need to clock in and a whole lot of other things. And you are there on your feet from half past seven till half past four. And yeah, so it was strictly that, you know, the manufacturing world. Yeah. So um, I learned quite a lot of skills there. But then when I was there, uh, I think I was a bit getting tired of routine work because yeah. I was doing almost the same thing every week. And I knew I knew what I needed to do and how to do it. Even if you were to wake me up in my sleep and ask me to, 
um, yeah. characterize the carbon black or whatever, I would wake up at 2 a.m. and I would tell you what the spec would be. So because I think of my, well, the personality and my interest as a person, um, I think they also came to sort of like guide me in yeah. terms of the career path. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm getting bored. I'm no longer interested to go to, to work because I'm doing the same thing. So what else can I actually do now yeah. in, this, in this particular career? Yeah. And I was like, mm -mm, I actually want to go back to school. And yo, I, I couldn't handle wearing the lab coat and I'm a cool yeah. And, you know, not looking <laughs> <laughs> like a lady. Because yes, but when you work in a firm, you, 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 there's, there's, there's that PPE. So, and I was like, there was a lot of things that I was going to be telling. So you know, was your, your personality and what you needed to be. Uh, you know, M7Z in a way, in a way, yeah, in okay. a way. All right, so you decided rather you go back and study. So I decided to rather go back and study, and um, at that time they had extended my contract at Dunlop because remember, in service training, is always it's only one, one year, and then you go back and you graduate for your national diploma. So they extended my contract for another year. And then I terminated the contract, I think after um, six months of that extension. And I was like, I actually want to go back to school. And I asked them if they were going to allow me some time off because at the time we were, we used to have evening classes in the BTEC chemistry stream. So I, I thought maybe they were going to allow me to at least, you know, just go to evening classes and do it on a part-time basis. Yeah. But then they were like, no, um, we cannot fund you for that. And we cannot sponsor um, yeah. all that. And so I, I needed to make a tough decision. And that tough decision was to leave the job, even though I was used to getting my salary and everything else. But luckily, I, I had already spoken to the Cheetah people, that is my sponsors. Yeah. So they, they assured me that they were going to pay for my fees again and um, res and everything else. So I went back to being a full-time student. I went back to res and then I enrolled for my BTEC and I did it on a full-time basis. Yeah. And I think because of the skills that I had already acquired during my in-service training yeah. and because I've already seen the application side of things, yeah. um, I, did, I did quite good in my BTEC. Yeah. I, was, I was actually in the top three of, of my entire BTEC um, crew class. Wow. So I did quite well, I, I must say. All right, and, and after you did so well, um, then what was next for you? I wanted to do my master's. Wow, okay. Now you're starting <laughs> to think like, a, okay, I wanna be an academic now, <laughs> all right, okay. But I wanted to be an academic and slash, I wanted to be a researcher because I could see that my interest was in doing research and not yeah. routine work because I've already seen what routine work is in chemistry. And I knew that I did not like it for me and for my personality and for my growth as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted something that was going to interest me each and every single day. And research was the only option I had at that time. So, yeah. yeah. Am I wrong, Bangati, uh, your attention span, uh, you know, it's not too much. If if the icon is a character, so can you psychologist by a queen stamp, time again, but for ATG, but they would ATG of that. Well, you are not wrong at all. Um, I think I have different energies and different interests, and there was a change and go, go, go. And um, I think it's acceptable. It's okay. Oh, no, I didn't judge you. I was just saying. <laughs> You know, <laughs> okay. So you went and did your MTech, uh, which you bought cum laude. Now tell us yes. about that. Okay, so I did my MTech, and at the time I was, I did my MTech on a full time basis, and the first year was fine. I was doing very well. Um, I dedicated all my time to my research because I wanted to finish within that two years. And um, I received funding from National Research Foundation. So I had funding and I was okay. You know, I was, I was fine, but I was still living at res, funny yeah. enough. 
And um, in my second year of my master's, of my, of my MTech, I got pregnant with my first daughter. You. So Dani, the pressure Dani, now. Dani, you said no mistake before. <laughs> now, what happened? <laughs> so now the pressure was to sort of like complete this degree within that specified time, you know? So I was pushing myself a lot. Like I used to sleep in the lab. I used to work on weekends. I used to do quite a lot of things. Um, and the thing is with me, when I was doing my MTEC, I was not only, I was not only focusing on my colleagues from DUT, like I had other colleagues who were giving me a lot of support and, 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 and from different universities. So I was quite involved in so many things, even the science engagement. And so I was, I was everywhere. And I, I received all my support from different angles. And I think that also assisted in me, that, that also assisted me in completing my MTech in, in record time of two years. And so when my daughter was seven, uh, no, when I was on my seven months of pregnancy, I, I submitted my thesis. I think it was around June or something of that year, June of that second year. And then it went to the examiners for two, if not three months. And then I went and I gave birth and I came back and I had to go to a conference and voila. And when I got my results for my, my, from my MTech that I have passed with cum laude, I was quite excited because I knew that I had um, put in the extra hours and the extra effort. So yeah, it was quite yeah, refreshing. Let's, let's, let's press a pause <laughs> there. Let's press a pause there. Um, what lessons did you learn uh, life lessons, uh, you know, um, you had not planned uh, to fall pregnant at that point. It was a critical time, a critical year for you to finish your course, but uh, you made certain decisions, uh, you made certain sacrifices, uh, and at the end of the day, you were able to, you know, not compromise your studies and, uh, you know, still be able to go and uh, deliver, look after your baby and come back. So what lessons did you learn out of that? Okay, what I learned is with me, all, okay, all my life, I've always been this person who always finishes what, whatever I start, whatever project I start. So I was not about that life of just leaving things hanging. Yeah. So that was another driving factor. And at the same time, I, I tried to get as much support from different people yeah. um, so that they can actually assist me in achieving this goal of completing my MTech in record time. And I also got to learn a lot um, still about time management, project management, and you know, all those skills that you actually need because you also need discipline as well. So I, I, I worked on my discipline as well, you know, not going out, not seeing friends, not spending time, you know, time you cannot account for. So it was quite um, some tough decisions and tough, um, how do I put it? But yes, yeah, I think I've answered your question. Lovely, lovely. Uh, so you finished your MTech uh, and then uh, you went uh, to work for CSIR. Am I right? Yes. All right. As okay. a, what, what do you call it now? Um, as a research scientist, just tell us a little bit now. How did that, was it also something that just came, fell on your hands, or is it something that was deliberate <laughs> that I'm going to go to CSIR? Yeah. Okay. With, with the CSIR thing, I, I don't know how my things actually happened. So I was here on Facebook and chatting to this other girl by the name of Wendy Kwezi. Wendy. Um, I think she was doing her master's with VETS, if not VUT, I can't quite remember. So we're talking about the conference we're supposed to attend. Um, it was a chemistry conference that was gonna be held in Johannesburg. So I think she was just touch basing. And she started telling me about the opportunities that CSIR had at the time. And she gave me everything, the links and um, the application details. So there was um, there were opportunities for 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 interns, yeah. interns that have completed their masters, um, and their internship program was for one year. Yeah. So I applied and I was shortlisted and interviewed, and then I got the job. 
And that yeah. happened all in a space of like a month. Yeah. So I went to Pretoria and I joined CSIR. Um, so when I got to Pretoria, I, I always had this thing in me that, okay, if I have my master's, I might as well just go straight to PhD and complete the PhD so that I don't only have master's. So at least at the back of my mind, I had that. And I knew that joining um, an organization like CSIR, it was going to force me and sort of like push me in that direction because every other second person that I met at CSIR was a doctor. One has a PhD, one is a professor, one is that, you know? So that was also another motivating factor. But when I got there, I started looking at different projects because remember you are assigned um, a supervisor or a direct manager that you, you need to speak to on a daily basis. And then I sat down with my line manager at that time and his name is Greg Gordon. And we sat down, he asked me, he was like, Zikona, what do you really want? What do you want to do? I can see you are already bored because was, it was only a month and I was already bored with the lab work. Um, so we sat down and I was like, actually, I want to do my PhD, um, but I'm not sure if I can be able to enroll for my PhD now because I just started with this job and, 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 and. So he was like, you know what, um, with me, I do not have any funding for a PhD, but what I can try and do is I'm going to speak to some other guys in. You guys are done. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to speak to some guys from, from CSIR and see if they do have any, any funding for a PhD so that you can just cross over to those units and um, enroll for your PhD. So I was like, okay, that's fine. So I did my own homework. Um, I started finding out what they are doing at CSIR in Durban. Yeah. I was in Pretoria, right? Yeah. For the internship. So I, I started speaking to this guy by the name of Professor Bruce Sitole. He was a director of, um, of a unit at CSIR yeah. in Devon. So I told him about my intentions and what I wanted to do. Because I've always been this person that wanted to look at um, the waste and developing value-added products from the waste. So he was the guy who was working in that space at CSIR. So I approached him and we had a couple of interviews and conversations. And then he was like, okay, I do have funding for you. Um, if you can please come down to Devon so that we can speak face to face. So I told my line manager at the time that, okay, I've spoken to so-and-so and this is what he says. So he was like, okay, take the bus to Devon. I took a bus to Devon. Mm. And then I met up with uh, Professor Bruce and we had a chat about what I wanted to do. And okay, he did confirm that he's got funding and he asked me to come back next week and start with my PhD. So wow. I ended up staying in Devon for another two days because I needed to sort out my registration things. So I did my registrations and as they say, yeah, the rest is history. All right, yeah. And uh, you were able to finish your PhD in record time, three years. Yeah. What, what was the secret of that success? Who you would have to kill me in order for you to in order for me to tell you that I'm kidding. Um, the secret is really dedication. It's discipline. It's passion. It's I always tell people that you cannot do this thing on your own. You need people to assist you. You you need a strong support system. This is from your family. You need a strong support system from your colleagues, from different universities, from from wherever. So I, I tried and I looked for a lot of help from different people. And during my PhD, I initiated a research visit to, 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 to travel to the US because I knew that we did not have some of the infrastructure that I needed for my data analysis. So I initiated all those talks and conversations with different people. I didn't even know the guy, but I sent him an email and he responded. He said, you can come to University of Alabama and we've got such and such instrument that you can use for your data collection. And so I started sourcing out funds to go to the University of Alabama. And then when I went to my supervisor, I just went to him and I was like, okay, I spoke to so-and-so and I've got funding from wherever and I want to go for so many months. And this is what I'm going to be doing when I get to University of Alabama. Please sign on these jotted lines and then, yeah, just support this journey. So I, I am that person who is always initiating things and I always try and 
motivate for the reason why I want to do certain things. And then, you know, you only need just one, if not two people to believe in your story. And if you can motivate very well, then good for you. So those are some of the things that I actually did. And um, that is how I got to finish my PhD in record time of three years. All right. You know, what you just said now reminds me uh, of a book um, uh, by Malcolm Gladwell uh, it's called Outliers. Where yes. In the first chapter, they talk a lot. Or when he, he talks a lot about the fact that most people who are successful, when you actually ask them, you know, what's the secret, you know, of their success, they will always like, you know, uh, I did it all on my own, this, that, that, that. But what he says is that um, there is no self-made person. There's no self-made person uh, to achieve success. Uh, if you think properly, uh, there is some advantage that you got. Uh, you know, uh, you met somebody at a particular point or, you know, but somebody enabled you. Yes. You know, so an opportunity that another person, maybe even more brilliant than you, could have got, but they never yeah. got it. And you got that opportunity. You got privilege, you know, being at the right place at the right time, you know, talking to the right. And so when you then become a successful person, you must not lie. And it's like, you know, it's all about you and your brilliance. You know, there's a number of people along your journey who yeah. have actually enabled you. I mean, just listening to you now, uh, there's so many people, you know, the guy at CSIR, uh, you know, in Pretoria, you know, uh, the guy uh, at CSIR in UK, in, 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 uh, in Durban, Durban, the guy at Alabama, you know, I can go on and on and on. But I think the point here is that um, sometimes it is important to acknowledge that it's not all about you. You know, mm. and I'm not talking about you specifically. I mean, remember, we are yes, being watched by everyone. Uh, and uh, just listening to your story, uh, they can see where, you know, uh, I would say your guardian angels just put you in touch with the right people, you know, and you took uh, those uh, opportunities and you maximize them to the point where you are now. So, yes. okay, so you got your PhD and then what? I mean, you seem like somebody <laughs> just uh, likes to do things. What are you thinking postdoc now? <laughs> I did a stint of a postdoc and uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm venturing into so many things right now. Um, I'm looking into entrepreneurship. I'm, I'm looking into, yeah, different projects basically. Yeah, but, I, um, I, we, are still <laughs> at, we are still at NMU. So you are a senior lecturer at NMU. Yes. You are teaching students uh, mm -hmm. is it physical chemistry. What do you call it? Physical chemistry. Physical chemistry. Um, but, all right, so, so, so you enjoy what you're doing, I'm assuming. I love it. Okay. I love it. But then you're already looking. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think I'm and I'm the unstable. I don't yeah. know, but I, I can't do just one thing and focus on it. Oh, go, go, go. Like, I feel like, <sighs> okay. Yeah, being busy. Okay, let's go back. During your master's, you had a child, all right? Yes. Who did the parenting? Did you go drop them down a Queenstown and Muyu Zokunda? You know? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I had a strong support system from my parents. And remember, I said, my mother had me when she was 15. So she has never got that opportunity to be a mother to me because yeah. she went back to school after giving birth to me. Yeah. So I think now she wanted to fill that void by looking after my daughter at the time. Yeah. Okay. So she was like, okay, bring that child to me and I want you to focus on, on, on yourself and whatever you still want to do and on your dreams. So yes. I, I don't take that lightly and I don't even... I know it's a privilege because I know a lot of people would want to do that, but they they cannot. So and um, so I I drop <laughs> I literally shipped my I literally shipped my daughter to my mother's house, 
and I only got to stay with her for the first time ever this year. You won't believe it. And she's 10 years this year. Cool. All right. <laughs> That's very interesting. But how's the bond, though, between you and her? Does she know that you are the mom? No, 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 she does because I used to do I used to do regular visits. Um even 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 back then, like I used to do regular visits like once or twice a month, in as much as it's far from Devon, but I used to try because I, I knew how important that bond was. Yeah. So I made it a point that even on holidays I would come and fetch them and then yeah, they would visit. So okay. we have a great bond, I would like to believe. You tried to make up for that. Okay. Lovely. I did. All right. And uh, I can see you have got a double barrel. Uh, that means at some point, uh, somebody proposed, um, you know, and you accepted and you got married. When did this happen? Yeah. Okay. This all happened in the mix of things. I think I was in my first year of PhD. So Kelopu to a thick and yeah, he 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 yeah, he said all the right things. So <laughs> yes, he said all the right things. Um, and I think the timing was right as well, because yeah. I I knew what I wanted and I knew um, how to get what I wanted at that time in terms of my career. So I was already, you know, I was I was fine in terms of you know acquiring whatever I needed at that time career I am if I may put it that way yeah. so it all happened in 20 2013 yeah. and then I had my second born um my son in 2015 I was in my final year of my PhD yeah. just after submitting my my PhD thesis I yeah I was already yeah yeah with my son <laughs> so okay. both my kids they were born in the Mix of me being a master's student and a PhD student. So to my business, I'm a master's, no PhD. I'm a <laughs> All right. So, but now you were somebody's wife as well. Uh, yes. You know, most, uh, <clears throat> when, when you get married as a woman under South African law, you can keep your surname uh, or you can drop your surname, pick up your husband's surname, uh, or you can actually keep you know, both and the, when the double parent. So what made you to decide by when you are being given? Okay, um, the first reason, I get asked this question a lot. The first reason is, um, remember I said, from my mother's side. So that means I've been using my mother's same name for the longest time, um, kids. Okay. So I only got to, meet my dad i think i was 11 if not 12. so i started using his same name late in life and yeah. i think i was still excited to have that same name that kind of thing you know yeah. so i that was another motivating factor as to why i needed to keep that same name yes and at the same time during my and master's I identity thing <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah. And um, during my master's, uh, I, I did publish um, a manuscript and it was under my same name, which is my father's same name. Yeah. So I did not want to lose track of that, you know, because with us researchers, we, when we publish, we have to use almost the same details that we have been using all these years. So I did not want to start from scratch and then people start asking, who is this person now? Yeah. You know, so I wanted people to be able to link the prior research that I did to the research that I'm currently doing, you know, using the very same kind of, yeah, same name. That makes sense. That makes a yeah. lot of sense. All right. So, um, um, so now you are in PE. I'm not yes. talking about now. I mean, you are in Queenstown now, but in terms of work, you actually in PE. All right. And you're saying you want to go entrepreneurial. I mean, why? I mean, that, that doesn't make sense to me. An academic who has invested so much time uh, in being an academic, then all of a sudden you want to go entrepreneurial. Do you have any business skills or, that you've learned over the years or maybe the, at, at, at the business school there at uh, NMU? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think I've, I've mentioned that my research, the research that I did for my PhD, it was on the biorefinery process. And the yeah. biorefinery is basically taking waste and making value-added products from waste. 
Okay. And in South Africa, we've got a problem. We've got an environmental uh, problem. That is, there's a lot of waste, but that waste is not used. Yeah. So when I go into business, obviously it's not going to be a full-time thing. It's just going to be a side thing because I would be able to integrate the academia skills as well as my... Because remember, when you're a researcher, you get to be a business person as well. People don't know this, but there's a lot of skills that you actually get to get to learn in the process, especially in the PhD pro process. You get to learn a lot and, and, and yeah, it's a university of life kind of situation. So I, I, you must always have that thing at the back of your mind that you are developing something that is going to solve some challenges, whatever challenges we are facing in South Africa. And, yeah. I mean, that's what the PhD is all about. Yeah. So with, with me, I did see a niche in terms of there are some, there is a need for this kind of business that I want to be involved in. And obviously okay. not leaving academia, not, I'm not really canceling academia at all. So this is just me, you know, expanding yeah. on my so-called skills. Yeah. It's not so-called skills, on your skills. <laughs> <laughs> on my skills. Yeah, okay. All right. So uh, basically, uh, with your advanced studies, you were able to find a gap in the market yes. that requires a vehicle, you know, for you to actually bring it to life. Uh, it mustn't just yes. end there, you know, in you being cited for this and cited for that. Yeah. Uh, I, I hosted another professor here about three weeks ago or two weeks ago, Professor Dover, um, who's the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at UKZN. Oh, yes. And, uh, she gave me um, a name for this. She said something like uh, transitional something, you know, but where you are translating what you came yes. up with, you know, in your PhD, to actually putting it in place. Just like for her, she had uh, in, you know, uh, researched something about uh, the hair of black people, ethnic hair. And so after her PhD, she felt she needs to take it further to now developing yeah. products that are actually yes. going to prove that which, you know, uh, so I, I'm saying in the same way, you want to take the knowledge that you came up with, the, you know, and actually innovate and, bring that to life yes. without necessarily, uh, you know, abandoning your academic, you know, uh, academic. Uh, yes, true. Okay, lovely. Now it, it makes sense. Um, it makes sense. All right. So, but how are you going to juggle all of these things? Entrepreneur, academic, wife, <sighs> mother, you know, there's just so many things uh, or it's still that ADHD thing. <laughs> I, I think so, hey, I, I think so. But I, I, I would also like to believe that um, there is a purpose. There is a purpose why God would give me yeah. all these plates that is full of the salads in this entire life thing. There is really a purpose because yeah. so I, I strongly believe that. And um, if I feel strongly about something, I go for it. Whether I fail or I pass, I, I go for it. So mm. I'm just going to give it my all and I will see where it ends or where it takes me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're not getting itchy now to try. And I, I mean, when I asked you about the postdoc, you didn't really commit. Eh? <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you can even see in my biography, I, I, I job help a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I think it also has got to do, <laughs> I think it has everything to do with this. Did you say it's ADT? <laughs> I was saying ADHD. Well, you're ADHD. not in the yet, but I'm just <laughs> thinking, you know, uh, this low, short attention span and you get bored easily. I'm sure Gaban to a class in, you know, who used to be the noisemakers, you know, very clever. Uh, they will finish their work and then start disturbing other kids in class, you know, uh, but when the aeroplane is a map paper and all of those kind of things, uh, were well, you not that disruptive child, the class? I am, I am not going to confirm on the vumi or ending of vumi. I would just say, well, you must <laughs> judge for yourself. <laughs> 
All right. But yeah, I I I I I like it here at NMMU. I started working at NMMU this year, beginning of this year. Yeah. And um so we will see how it goes, but it, yeah. it looks promising. It looks promising. Right. Yeah. Um, so I did I did a stint of my postdoc, um, yeah. but I, I was I was very busy with a lot of things. I did not even I did not give give my postdoc any attention at all. Um, yeah. It was actually less than a year, yeah. and I did not get any results out of it because I was all over. I was I was hectically busy. I was busy. Yeah, uh, I hope it's not <laughs> a situation of a you know, uh, somebody from Queenstown coming to this big town called PE uh, and getting confused by too many lights. Uh, <laughs> all in, right. In, I've, I've always been, I think I've always been, even though I come from the village, but I, man, when it comes to lights, and so I don't yeah. get confused by the lights. All right. But anyway, another issue now, uh, or something I thought I needed to ask you about, um you founded a foundation you yes. know when i was uh, advertising this con conversation i said chemistry expert and philanthropist now I, I want us to just talk about that you know um what triggered you to set up that foundation and what does your foundation do okay okay let me start with the second question or the first one what triggered Okay, so as you did mention that um, I'm at the higher um, institution of learning. So I did manage to, to pick up some of the challenges that our students go through, especially first year students. Um, number one, they are confused. They don't even know what, what is there. They don't know what's out there. Um, about, about, and for not about that direction, but they are not really, <sighs> I come to Guazuba Gaida Abamvayo, if I may put it that way. And at the same time, fine, they've got their cell phones, they've got social media, but I'm not sure if they are able to, to, to source out the information about Dingayo through social media. I think they use it for all the wrong things and not the right things. So there was quite a lot of things and challenges. And I've 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 been a lecturer at University of Guazulu Natal. UNIZULU, which is a rural university, University of Forte, which is also another rural university. So what actually triggered or not triggered, um, influenced or rather motivated me to start my foundation was when I got to University of Forte. And remember University of Forte is in the Eastern Cape. So I, 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 I think I connected a bit with, with the students from University of Forte. And the reason why I would say that is because I was born and bred in the Eastern Cape. So I, 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 I've always wanted to give back to the youth of the Eastern Cape, but I didn't know how to go about giving back to the youth of, of the Eastern Cape. Because I actually felt, okay, maybe with lecturing or being an academic, um, it was sort of like, take me in that direction of giving back. But then I thought about other things and other challenges that the students are currently facing, you know, yeah. um, sourcing out information and yeah. and funding as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I I discovered that gap in Dobana, our students, they even though career guidance is done in many schools, but when they got to when they get to tertiary, they don't really know what they want to do. That is why they swap and change from one course to another. So they do not have proper career guidance. So I was like, okay, let me try and assist them. And I used to assist them, you know, on an individual kind of basis. And then until I, I, I entered the Mrs. South Africa competition, which is another thing that I did. And with Mrs. South Africa, they, they sort of like, um, how do I put it? You, 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 you have to be able to say, this is what I'm doing uh, to, yes. to, 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 you know, to add value to others who may be- To add you. value to others. And, you know, those are, they are really focusing on that, you know, especially community development. Yeah. So they also helped me to actually see the light in terms of how I wanted to do this whole thing. So they actually inspired as well as support 
and um and yeah with the help of the other ladies from Mr. south africa i got to identify exactly what i wanted to do in terms of what i wanted the foundation to be because they are all for community development community engagement and all that so um that's how get dr zeti and foundation was founded and yeah. formed um and Dr. ZTN Foundation is basically a, a, a youth and career development um, foundation that is basically looking at giving out or rather support to your metric students that actually want to enroll for university admissions yeah. for different courses and also providing career guidance on what course do you want to do? How can we assist? Can we get you a mentor that is going to mentor you? while you are a grade 12 student or you have already enrolled for a different course or you want to do post-grad. So it, it does all that. And we also try and raise funds for the university application fees as well as university registration fees for our students, um, especially from the rural areas. And, um, you know, and we also are involved in what is called the Fitted for Work um, clothing drive. That is, we are collecting clothes from our friends and you know, just different organization. And we we give out those clothes to students that are coming from disadvantaged backgrounds that are going to be attending university, I mean, sorry, um, in service training um, interviews or job interviews, or maybe students that are going to be graduating, but then Abana Zimba that kind of thing. So that is what the foundation is actually currently doing. Okay, lovely. And, uh, you know, the beneficiaries uh, of those things, uh, I appreciate, I, I hope. Yes, they do. Um, they do appreciate, but some you actually feel that they feel entitled. And they, I, I think most of them, they actually think I get paid to do what I'm currently doing with the foundation. Yeah. Like they do not understand that I'm just um, an NGO. So I use my resources, I use my time and I don't get paid to do it. Cause you can see when some send you emails, they like, they feel entitled. And I do have a problem with that from our youth. They feel entitled to a lot of things and they are not willing to sort of like meet you halfway as well. Mm. So some they do appreciate and some who uh, 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 Yeah. Um, all right. But uh, at least, uh, you know, you're still continuing uh, to yes. be of help uh, to them. But now, specifically, you are an expert in the area of chemistry, all right? There are not many Black people, uh, okay, I've got no stats here, but my assumption is there are not many people like you, all right? We need more people uh, who are, you know, uh, experts in your space. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Uh, to actually consciously, uh, you know, get people to choose the same path, Yako, yeah, yeah, chemistry. Okay, so it it starts with um, it starts with early career guidance, and what I mean by career, it starts from high school. Yeah. So you need to groom abandonabase high school to sort of like love and perform in stem subjects because that's the only way they can be able to follow this career path that is number one and also when they get to university the, the mentoring and the grooming it still does not stop yeah. so sort of like support and channel them to 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 that particular direction that you want them to take yeah. and um i've also discovered the this thing of i've, I've I've always been this person who wants to partner with the industry because yeah. I strongly believe that when, when you expose the students to different industries so that they see what this whole career is all about, they become more interested. So yeah. I've, I've, that's what I've also been doing, you know, sort of like taking the students and visiting different industries. But now COVID happened, so we can't do any of that. So we visit different industries so that they actually see the actual science that happens in those industries. Because some, they understand what chemistry is, but they do not know that chemistry is around them, yeah. you know? So, um, so these are some of the ongoing things that I'm currently doing to sort of like support these particular students that I want to, 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 to take into this journey with me. Okay, so basically 
you as you are going up you are also pulling people up with you definitely uh, anything in particular about girl children specifically now we, we are in the women month you know is there anything uh, that you are doing specifically to uplift uh, girl children or young women uh, you know uh, remember so we expect a lot from you eh? um okay through my mentorship I, I i try and at least adapt to personal mentees that i personally mentor and give my time to so one of them is my master's student and one is my phd student that is at cut cut yeah. in, in blomfontein yeah. uh but that student i'm actually co-supervising but at the same time i'm also mentoring that student yeah and so those are my two mentees for this year but yeah. each and every year i I'm, I'm going to try and see if i can get more girls to sort of like groom and mentor as i am moving you know yeah. but it, it becomes really tough because time is really against all of us yeah. but we yeah. we try and do the little that we can do you know all right now um in 2019 you were the winner um of inspiring 50 women in stem what did that mean to you who that um it sort of like put a lot of pressure <laughs> it put a lot of pressure for me because i was firstly i was nominated amongst the best um young south africans and it, it actually meant that i was doing something right even though i actually felt it was not good enough and it meant that i needed to continue doing what i was doing because that means the universe is accepting and the universe is watching and that means the people are actually supporting me as well out there and it it, it basically meant that i needed to push harder but i i was extremely humbled and honored to be to be featured in that list um yeah. because it features the likes of 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 siagoli Zozbini, Tunzi, you know and all these big shots that are doing incredible things out there so i actually felt i did not deserve to be in that list mm. um but yeah it was hum it was a humbling experience to be featured in that list uh but you you're being humble now because in 2018 you were awarded the fourth edition of Science by Women Fellowship for a research visit in the Spanish Center of Excellence. So you should have expected uh, this STEM thing. Well, you know, you, I don't know how to, uh, yeah. I, uh. Okay, then. <laughs> okay, lovely. Come All back. Right. I have no comeback. All right. But just for the uninitiated, you know, not everybody understands these acronyms STEM. Just tell us about STEM and why, you know, it's so important at high school level for kids to actually choose to do STEM subjects, you know, for a country like ours, which is a de developing country, you know, just the importance, uh, you know, uh, of, of, of channeling kids to do STEM subjects. Okay, so STEM stands for science, engineering, mathematics, technology um no no is it stem s-t-e-m so it's yeah. science technology engineering and mathematics yes. right yes. so why it is important for 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 young kids to to do in a country, STEM like, ours. Yeah. In a in a country. country like ours okay remember we are a developing country so that means we we still need a lot of things in order for us to be a developed country and we we need to partake in a whole lot of other things i think COVID also showed us that we we are way backwards with a, a whole lot of things that other developed countries have and i'm just going to now zone it in into technology yeah maybe just pick technology as an example so the reason why we need the young kids to enroll in stem subjects is because in order for our country to develop and to increase our economy and a whole lot of other things we need um the stem expertise from 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 our youth we need to innovate we need to we need to innovate we need, we to, need produce, to produce yes i mean we were almost dependent on china for ppes 
Uh, uh, which is quite which is which is quite embarrassing because those are basic those are basic things that we are supposed to be able to manufacture on our own as a country. Now we are, you know, as 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 people with chemistry, we eat sanitizers. You know, we have. There's to... an answer. No, there's an answer. Sanitizer, NMMU, Doho. Okay. There's an answer, and we we make our own because even in our university right now, if you were to go around the university, this sanitizer, the address is seven desire, and we even donate to um the schools as around PE. So we 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 are innovative. <laughs> All right, but now you need to actually develop the manufacturing capacity. To, yes. to, to, so that we don't import those things, or at least intubate uh, some, so, you know, some company, you know, some entrepreneurial venture uh, that will then maybe, you know, run with that. But I mean, so, do, so now do you see why it's important for that entrepreneurship skills to come in? Yeah, no, I can see, I can see. Yeah. <laughs> Is that uh, under that alu, there's a, there's a name yes. here. Um, I'll tell you just now. Um, Aluna. Yes, Al Aluna Pty Limited Investments. Is that the vehicle yes. that you are using for your entrepreneurial ventures? Yep. All right. Now, South Africa. You know, if if you are in PE, you know, PE is called the 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 the, the windy city, right? Um, but uh, and and I can see that uh, that is you know the the wind is being harvested. So that uh, you know can generate a, 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 you know a, a, a electricity and stuff like that. Electricity. But, yeah, you know, um, yeah. But when it comes to the issue of converting waste into energy, how are we doing as a country? Um, we we are doing very bad considering the fact that we've got a lot of waste that is just sitting there and um, not, use, not used for value-added products like that. I, I, I think we are moving very slowly in that direction. And yeah. that is why I actually feel that um, that is the space that one really needs to try and, and operate in. Yeah. Because it's a space that is not utilized and yet there's there's a lot of waste in and around the country yeah 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 i mean my home so we, we are we are not we are not doing very well i must be honest we are actually not anyway because if we, if we go to any township there's piles and piles of waste right even the cbds now you know uh, in, in in the big cities like you know p there's a lot of there waste is. everywhere my hometown of Mtata, I'm sure it can generate a lot of energy, you know, <laughs> because it must be one of the dirtiest towns, you know. And, uh, not, uh, and not only energy. I mean, there's a lot of products that we can all make from our waste. And I'm just going to be giving an example. I know um, a lot of people, they think of plastic as something that has that we are doing away with. But, yeah. you know, if you were to collect that plastic waste, you can be able to make some other plastic um, materials from the plastic waste yeah. that you are collecting, like ukwenza or e, e cubes, pipes. Um, so you can still be able to 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 make some other value added products from from those kind of waste. So it's just that we are not tapping into that territory as of yet, and that is why I would safely say that we are really not doing well when it comes so, to utilizing so what, that waste. What, what do we need to do to get people? to actually see opportunity in the waste? I think more than anything, we, we need a lot of support. Um, we need a lot of financial support because if we are starting up, um, if we are starting up companies that are going to be using that waste to generate different products. So that means we need a buy-in from either the private companies that are already doing the work and we also need to work with our communities as well because it's it's a whole value chain and also the academic the academics they need to be able to work with the industry and the communities and that is how we are supposed to be doing this whole working together so thing when are you gonna do that i'm putting I, I'm, I'm i i'm actually working on it watch this space i'm on it yeah okay all right, and uh, maybe in a year or two, I'll, I'll call you back and say, uh, yes. 
remember you made this promise that uh, we will have cleaner townships because you will have worked with various stakeholders to make sure that mm. that garbage uh, that everyone throws out there is actually turned into something much more valuable. Can I hold you to that? Yes. Yes, please hold me to it. Okay. Everybody must hold me to that. Okay, lovely. Now, let's just move now away from the academics um, and all the things that you're doing. You entered a Mrs. South Africa competition now. What is that? No, I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm not saying, but it's, it's just unusual. Uh, this top academic PhD lady and she goes and starts her stuff there, you know? I, I told you about my confidence levels. Yeah. And um, with me, I, I, I was actually looking for a women empowerment program, basically. Yeah. And I learned about Mrs. South Africa and how it empowers women. And, yeah. you know, in my field, there's not, there's not a lot of women in my field. So yeah. I think I also needed that um, sisterhood from, from, from different industries because I actually felt I'm spending a lot of time with men. I need some females in my life. So yeah. Mrs. South Africa gave me that opportunity to sort of like connect with a lot of females mm. and from different industries because I've always been this person who only knows people in science, academia, and then that's it. But then with Mrs. South Africa, I was exposed to a different whole new world altogether, you know? Mm. And um, I think I loved everything about it because yeah. even up to today, the skills that we, we got from the Mrs. South Africa pageant, these are the very same skills that I use even for my foundation, uh, even for my business, because you are taught quite a lot of things and people think it's all about wearing swimwear and just walking in your swimwear. It's not all about that. Yeah, it's not the issue of uh, what's your favorite dish, tapaway. No, not at all. You, you are basically taught to go to different companies and stakeholders and fundraise. You must raise funds for this event, for that event. So you are knocking on different doors. You are doing presentations. You, you know, it, it was really a women empowerment program because you were taught to sort of like step up and take charge. Yeah. So it was not all about wearing heels and applying makeup. So that's one thing I even loved about it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So there's something that you took out of it. Yes. Uh, you would encourage other about your misses uh, to venture in the. Eh? Did you have to get permission <laughs> from Happy? <laughs> I would because um, I, I would because it, it really changes you and it really changes the way you see marriage and it really changes the way you see your role in that partnership, you know, and I think it also ignites that 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 personal. But your personal interest or personal dreams that you always had, but you could not, you know, attain them because of whatever challenges you had, maybe you got married when you were young. And then you couldn't do certain things. So it gives you that exposure and it gives you that opportunity to be yourself. So yeah. that is one thing I really love about that program. So like it removes you away from being a wife yeah. and then you step out to be Uzi Kona, who is a wife though. But you know, it, 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 it sort of like speaks to you a lot as but an individual how, now. How far did you go uh, in the competition? <laughs> Up to the top, um, top hundred semi finalist, yeah. And yeah, I, I, I had a lot of things going at, at that time because I started a new job, so I had recently relocated from um KwaZulu Natal to the Eastern Cape, so I was still trying to find my feet this side, and um, I think also my connections they were not really proper. And I failed to raise some funds that I was supposed to raise for different events because that is another requirement in order for you to move to the next um, stages of the, of the pageant. Yeah. Okay. All right. And um, in 19, oh, 2017, 2017, you were male and guardian 200 young South African. Uh, in the category of science and technology. What did that mean to you? This is now, remember, I started with 2019 and then I yeah. went 
2018, now I'm like at 2017, million guardian, top 200 uh, young South Africans in science and technology. Who? Um, yo, no, it, it, it really, it meant a lot for me. And I think it, it, it kind of opened a lot of doors for me, you know, even being featured in that list because I was also featured with some incredible and phenomenal young South Africans. And I, I got to meet them at an event in Joburg because we, we, we all traveled to Joburg. And we exchanged, so I did, it, it, it really exposed me to a whole new world altogether. But it's been an incredible journey because it, it provided me with a lot of opportunities. And um, I'm really grateful for, for, for that particular award because I think that was actually the start of my career as well. Yeah. Uh, because I just recently graduated with my PhD and the only thing I knew was just to be an academic yeah. So with with that with that particular um, um, accolade, I got to sort of like step out of my comfort zone, you know, attend events, being a speaker at a so-so event, you know, all those things were possible after I was given that so-called uh, that accolade of being um, a top two hundred, yeah. and I met some amazing people in that event as well. All right. So why do I get a sense that uh, behind this academic that you are, uh, there is a, a celebrity, you know, craving for some celebrity mm. thing uh, behind you? <laughs> Not at all. Um... I've always been this person, so it's not, it's not that I'm going to stop right now. Uh -huh. So it's 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 not really being a celebrity, but it has always been about who tell and and where, but who tell and that and that so so I can't I don't get on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and and, uh, <laughs> and all right, and um, so <laughs> you come from a Matribin. Uh, so yes. what are you doing for the young kids of Matribin? You know, any contribution you whether in terms of time, not necessarily money. In terms of time, you know, uh, that rural village where you came from. Okay. Um, through my foundation, yeah. I, I do contribute a lot um, in terms of, you know, just trying to assist the youth from, from, from my own village with a lot of things. Yeah. And, um, but with, with, I wish I could do more, but yo, my hands are so tight. My plate is so full, but I try and do as much as I can. Yeah. Uh, but not only for the Mikumini village, but for the rest of, 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 of the Eastern Cape as well as the country. Yeah. But obviously preference, it, all, it always starts with my Mikumini yeah. youth or students. All right. Now, people who know you from Facebook only will actually not relate to everything <laughs> that you just told us now about you and your journey to being at the top or at the top at the top of the you know academia dun dun, you know and the wow. lady Zico TN who will go and dance la Pabu Facebook and take videos of herself dancing and and then doing all the latest dancing <laughs> Why are you doing that to me? I was hoping you're not gonna get into that. <laughs> no, we're, we're talking authenticity. You know, you, you need to be the same person at work, socially, and everywhere. So that's a different I'm seven and outside is a different corner. So I actually believe people should just be themselves, you know, yeah, as long true. as it does not interfere with the work that you do. Uh, you should just be yourself. So we we'll don't have to dance, basically, uh, because you know that, that, that that's what we see there. And we'll, we'll be able to, <laughs> as uh, uh, what we see, <laughs> lots of pictures and, and hearts and whatever around you. Eh? I, I I think I think at heart I I am a very outgoing person. Um. 
Yes, that is it, though. Yeah, do yeah. you But at yeah. the same time, I think not do it takes over because of my personality and this is who I am, even at work. Like yeah. they know me to be this person. I'm loud, as you can see. I laugh, I I dance, I do everything. So okay. this is who I am. Like I saw anybody do find on Facebook. Now, this is who I am. Even at my in-laws, they know I would be dancing in front of them. Yeah. No issues. Okay. I know. Dr. Makoti. Exactly, exactly. But anyway, let's wrap up now, Siswam. So um you obviously, you know, have gone to the top as an academic, and you know, um, all the way from Emma Tribini, you've gone through different journeys and you got to where you are. All right. Now, what words of wisdom do you have for women, young women who aspire, you know, to get somewhere in life, not necessarily as academics? Yeah. Anything that they dream of. Okay, so number one, you must believe in yourself. That is number one. You must believe in yourself. I care call if when you don't think you are good enough. That is number one. And number two, don't be afraid to don't be afraid to fail. And the reason why I'm saying that, I told you, Indoba, I failed my mathematics in my first year. Mm. But that did not actually stop me from, you know, because I know a lot of people, when they trip and fall, they just want to stay down and then bang up. And number three, you must turn away from the voices in Solo City. You can't do it. I mean, you can be whatever you want to be in life. And don't, don't limit yourself, don't limit your dreams. You must be whatever you want to be. And you must strongly believe in yourself and go for what you want in life. And that's the only message I have. Mm. So that, you know, so you're basically saying it is possible. Definitely. Don't, don't limit your dreams. It is don't possible. Don't limit your dreams. Mm. So that's basically um, the message that you're saying to young people who would like to emulate your journey or go to the top in any other field. They must yes. just believe in themselves. They must not listen to people who say it can't be done. Yes. You know, they must put in some hard work, uh, though. Of course. You know, easily. Yes, um, I, I was about to say that. You know, people often see my post on Facebook. They're like, hey, you are always out there. When do you actually get time to, to, to work, you know? And people who actually know me personally, they know the amount of work and effort that I put in, in my own career. But obviously it's not easy for one to show what happens, you know, in the background, yeah. but um, hard, work is, hard work is everything. Yeah. And also your work ethic and your discipline, it will take you far because if you are not disciplined, that would mean Dobana when I was a driver from Monday to Monday. That doesn't happen. When it's time for look driver, it's fine driver, but gay, I was a driver or go, go, go. Like on Monday, you need to go back to being the person that on <laughs> go. Yeah, so I think I'm to Bana land over. If, if so and so can do it and Simbone driver, that means that is nice. I'm driver with, but I understand look driver. I'm back Now I wake up at four each and every day. Mm. And this is what I mean by discipline. Waking up at four, it means I know what I need to do and to push. In order for me, this is what I have a weekend. Push a little bit of a weekend. So that's one, that's another thing. People need to understand that there is a lot of hard work that goes behind the scenes. It's just that we don't normally show it because, yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, you are 34 years old. You've achieved so much. All right. I'm, 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 I'm telling them your age because that's what you put in your CV. If you didn't want me to talk about it, you shouldn't have put it in your, in your profile. <laughs> so you are 34 years old. You have achieved so much. 
So what's next, really? I mean, what's your next challenge before you get bored? Uh, yes, you okay. talked about the company. You talked about the company uh, and what you want to do. Uh, but besides the company, is there, if you look five years from now, okay, when you turn 40, what would you want to have achieved when you turn 40? Okay, so in the next two years, I'm going to be a professor, yeah. the youngest in my department, yeah. and the first ever black young South African professor in the physical chemistry. Lovely. So mm -hmm. that is my short-term goal. And yeah. as you see, you, know, you just need to watch the space. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I sounded right. like a celebrity there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, yes, you've got some elements of that, uh, you know, uh, but anyway, thank you, thank you, thank you, and, uh, you know, let me just call you Dr. Zico, man, because the, the rest... M7 is in, in man, Biza was ZTN, for them it's fine, yeah. which was ZTN, Ka. Okay, Dr. ZTN, thank you, thank you, thank you for agreeing to be featured uh, on this channel. Um, you know, you brought a lot of energy to this interview, uh, <laughs> a lot of laughter. Uh, yes, Yellow Bone, you lit up uh, the interview, uh, but also there was a lot of substance and content. It was at the end of the day, I was featuring you as an academic, uh, as somebody who should be an inspiration to younger people. Uh, and you've been able to do that in your own way. Uh, not very serious, but still be able, you know, to 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 say the things that uh, you know or share uh, some of the things that uh, you know uh, were your lessons. Uh, so thank mm -hmm. you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, you know, um, I'm sure when you get back to your Facebook page, you will find so many people who will have so many good things to say. Uh, but on behalf of this channel. I really want to thank you and may you continue to do good. May you make sure that, uh, you know, that uh, short term plan of being a professor uh, at age of 36 does take place, uh, you know, uh, and yeah, uh, I'll, 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 I'll keep on looking on Facebook, Kukuti, what's new, you know, uh, and if, if that waste thing comes up and you sign some big deal, I'll call you again and say, let's talk about that with company. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for, for giving me this opportunity and for hosting me. I really had so much fun. And I'm looking forward to having another conversation in the next two years as a professor. Lovely. It's going to happen. <laughs> From your mouth uh, to the guy upstairs. To God, yes, yes. Yes, yes it's going to happen. All right. Thank you okay. very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. That uh, was watching uh, this conversation. We didn't have a very good start. We started a bit late, but I hope we made up uh, for the late start. Uh, you know, and uh, I look forward to bringing another guest. We've got a very, very interesting guest coming up uh, on Saturday, but uh, I'll share the information tomorrow. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.